Um, so thank you all for participating and thank you Sifu uh, for joining us today. Um, as always, uh, we have so much to learn and we have so little time. And so let us begin. Um, okay, so last week we talked about chapter 21, the ending. Um, so we talked about what do we actually learn from chapter 21. And there were a couple of things that I, uh, that I raised that I thought of that were important. So what was exactly the transcendent powers? Because chapter 21 talks about the transcendent powers of the Tethagata. So what were they? Um, and I thought to summarize it, it's just basically making something that is impossible into something that is possible. And not only that, but making it so normal, making it the new norm. Something that was impossible before, making it into something that is not only possible, but accepted by everybody to seem to be, it is so, it is so normal, it is so straightforward. And also, but how do we do that? How do we do transcendent power? And we talked about really start from something small, start from something insignificant, but as long as, as, long as it is on the right track, on the right direction, that you can start from small to big, from one to infinity. For example, uh, we talked about the countless people that are suffering. With all the countless people that are suffering, um, we can't save all of them, but we can always start with the people, the, the, the few ones that we can reach and help. Um, there are boundless afflictions, troubling and hindering us. So let us start with the afflictions and habitual tendencies that we can actually change and remove. So it's always finding the ones that you can have um, that you can actually have control over, uh, the ones that you can actually easily do. And the universal truth is infinite. There's just infinite amount of truth. So let us start with something that we can understand, uh, accumulate a little bit, a little bit from there, right? Do something and accumulate from there. Change the habitual tendencies and go from there. Save and help the people around you and uh, the people that you can reach and start from there. But we don't just stop there, right? We continue from that point on. So we realize that not only do we have to help the people that we can reach, but we realize why we couldn't reach the ones that we want to help because we don't have the affinity. So let us begin fostering of the, the affinity. This is also very important. Master taught us the ways to foster the reach, foster the affinity to the ones that we otherwise don't have, right? So what, what about the afflictions that are very, very deep, right? It's no longer just you know, the, the ones that are light that you can remove. But what if, what if there are such deep afflictions that we're trapped with? Um, so uh, we did it unto ourselves. So I think it's more important that, that we have to share how we've changed. Yes, we start with the ones that we can change, but as we are sharing how we manage ourselves and go through how we did this, then it's essentially giving us more power to say, hey, other people did it this way. I didn't know we could do it that way. Now, maybe if we do it this way, it would actually work for us too. So you're, you're actually increasing. You're increasing the number of, of the afflictions that you're actually able to reduce. And I think that is very important by sharing. So also, how do we learn all the infinite dharma in the universe? Um, I think it is, is very important that Master taught us that dharma is in everything. So instead of trying to learn all, try to see all the Dharma that is in everything and then understand the ones that are in contact with you. Go in deeper, contemplate, reflect. And today, hopefully, we have enough time to go through some of the QA that, that, told, that told you, that told us exactly about the same thing. Okay, so how do we achieve all of that, right? How do we achieve all of that, you know, starting from what we know and foster more affinities? How do we do all of that? Well, Buddha left the palace to begin his journey, and so we should too. Leave our comfort zone. Leave the things and places that we think are our comfort zone because our comfort zones often hold us back. You know, if you do something for a while and you're, begin, you're growing accustomed to it and it, it, it becomes something of a comfort zone, then you need to take the next step. You know, how do you challenge yourself? How do you just not let, leave it to routine? How do you actually make it so that everything you do, you're mindful of it rather than just, oh, it's just something that we do. And I think this is also very important. 
if you remain in the palace, then you would just repeat the things that you do, or it bounds you and limits you on the things that you can see and feel and do. Therefore, leave the shackle, leave the boundaries of the palace, and we should do that too. So that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to talk about chapter 22, entrustment. And, and, and I want to take some time, a little bit of time, uh, to, to do the uh, brief um, parts that I thought that, that I summarized. I want to get to some more questions later because for all of you, I'm so, we're so blessed and we're so happy that many of you are uh, sending in questions, but I haven't been able to get to them. So today I'll get through parts of chapter 22 and I'll get through hopefully you know, a, a bunch of questions that we will be able to move the QAs so that everybody sort of have this discussion and begin to contemplate. You know, it's not answer, it's more contemplation. Okay, so this week, we're talking about chapter 22, entrustment. And, and, and I think if, if we remember, chapter 21 talks about transcendent powers of the Tathagata. But in chapter 22, entrustment, it's more talk about you can do it too. If Tathagata has the transcendent powers, chapter 22 tells you that you can do it too, and it is your turn now. And it's really what chapter 22 is talking about. It's, you know, following chapter 21 talks about all the great powers and transcendent powers and all the amazing powers that Buddha did. And, and Master shared that with us too. But in every part of the way, Master always talks about that we have this power too. We have it in us too. And now in chapter 22, not only is it that we can do it, but we have to do it. Okay, so that's what the difference is in chapter 21 and chapter 22. Now, in chapter 22, it began with three actions. And it talks about this too. It it's really talks about the body and your mouth and your mind, right? Senko, yi. But it breaks it down further. The three actions are the great compassion, no holding back and having no fear. And what this means is it's a little bit different from what we are used to. For example, Great compassion talks about not just about the compassion, but it talks about the equality of all sentient beings, right? The three actions talks about the teaching, the passing of the Dharma needs to find equality for all sentient beings. You don't just, you, you don't just pass on to certain people because, you know, they are not the same as others. All sentient beings have the inherent Buddha nature and the teaching and the passing on of the Dharma should be equal for all of them. And someone like Buddha showed us that even though we all have different capacities, but the teachings that the Buddha gave us were actually available to all of us from the very beginning. It's just that someone, somehow, when we're not ready, some were kept by, by the Buddha so that we would be able to learn it at the right time. But at the same time, there's no holding back. There is you know, at appropriate time to be given to all of us. But there is nothing that the Buddha says, I will not give to the students because there's a holding back, teaching everything that you have and then having no fear. This is not about fear of being wrong. This is about having no fear of the trivials, of, of, all, the, of, the, of all the small things that you have to go through, of all the patience that you have to have only to wait for the students to catch up. So have no fear and having no hindrance to hinder your teaching. So I categorize these three actions as the three actions that describe the attitudes of the teachers of Dharma. You must have the compassion so that you are willing to teach all. Yes, all have different capacity, but you don't stop just because you like certain people or you don't like certain people. You continue to teach all of them. As a teacher of Dharma, you treat all sentient beings equally. Yes, you teach them according to their capacity, but you don't discriminate based on what or who they are. So for example, you know, Buddha didn't discriminate against other animals just because they are in the animal realm. They, it's harder for them to learn, but at the same time, it doesn't, it doesn't reduce your responsibility to pass this dharma on to all sentient beings. So these three actions, the great compassion, holding no back and uh, no holding back and having no fear, these three actions describe 
the attitudes of a teacher. You know, all equal, all students must receive your teachings equally. And you shouldn't hold anything back just because you don't want, you, you want to, you know, you want to be better than your students. But in fact, all the teachers of Dharma should give everything that they know, even more than they know. And, and that, that's the amazing part, right? Sometimes you're giving off more. How do you give more than 100%? Yes, you could, because you are explaining the same thing over and over and over again to, to, to try to let other people to understand. So you have to give everything, reserve nothing. And at the same time, do not let the, you know, the petty small things hinder you. Every little details, every small things, as long as it helps the, te the students to understand. As a teacher of Dharma, these three actions describe your attitude. You should have these attitudes in order to pass on more Dharma. So other than the three, the three actions or the three attitudes, Master also talks about the three wisdoms. In fact, these three wisdoms has been talked about for a long time in the past. This time, they don't show up as these names, but it shows up as three wisdoms nonetheless. So what are they, right? So there are three levels, right? It's the knowledge or wisdom that is open and pertain to Sravaka and Pratika Buddha or uh, and what that means is these are the knowledge that is going for the first layer of the vehicles, right? Or the, um, the, um, the, uh, the first layer, right? The first vehicle, um, okay? The first vehicle uh, for, for their understanding. We're going we're gonna to go into what they actually are. Um, so um, the, uh, the second part is the Bodhisattva knowledge. And the third part, finally goes into the Buddha knowledge. So what are they actually? Let's talk about this. So the first layer, zhi, what does that actually mean? It means that you know everything there is to know and you have learned everything there is to learn. So it's very broad and it's very wide. Everything there is to know in the world, in the world where it's, there is physical, in the world, in the world where there is non-physical, you know and you learn. For example, you understand the astronomy. You understand how the world works, how, you know, how the sun rises. You understand all the physics. You understand all the astrophysics. You understand all the metaphysics. You understand all these things. And you understand the intangibles, the shapeless, the formless. For example, the interaction between people, the interaction between humans, the interaction between animals. You know all these things. You know all their knowledge there is to know. That's the first layer. And you'll be thinking about, wow, if that's the first layer, what would the second layer be, right? Something that's higher than that. So the first layer talks about knowing the knowledge, having the knowledge that is available to you. Okay, that's the first layer, right? The second layer is the bodhisattva knowledge. It's the knowledge of how to apply and when. Apply all there is to know. For example, you have tool number one, tool number two, tool number three, or you have you know, um, all these different theories, all these different knowledges. But how do you use them? When do you use them? To whom do you use it on? That requires another layer of knowledge that's called the bodhisattva knowledge. Apply all the knowledge that you know according to the situation according to the capacity of the people that you're applying to. When to do this, when to say this, when to apply, and why to apply, to whom do you apply to? That is hard, right? It's easy to know. It's hard to know when to use which. It's easy to know. But it's hard to know when is one missing and how do you make it up again? That's the hard part. So the first part is to know all there is to know, right? All the knowledge there is, you're trying to figure it out. You try to learn all of that. While you're learning, you're gaining your, your, your pool of knowledge about the worldly things and the outworldly things, right? The physical and the non-physical things. And then the next part is, well, now you know all of this. Good, apply them. And, and Master used a very good analogy 
um, always to help us understand. It was using the medicine and the doctors, right? So a doctor, without touching a patient, understands all the different diseases, all the different symptoms and all the diseases and their problems, understands all the different medicines and what they're supposed to do. Okay, the problem comes when you're actually diagnosing a patient, everybody is different. Everybody has a different syn synopsis. Everybody has a different idea about what happened. Not only that, it's not just one disease at a time. You could have three, four diseases combining at the same time. So their symptoms could cover each other. So how do you do all of that? That's the second knowledge, right? So the first layer is reading from the books, reading from the sutras, all the names, all the things, all the, all the, uh, all the nomenclatures, all the things that you're getting from the sutras, from the, from the textbooks, from all the people passing on this to you, you got, that's the first layer. The second layer is, well, how do you use that? Now you understand everything is empty. Good, how do you use that? You understand that there's wondrous existence. Good, how do you use that? That's the hard part. Now, so that's why this layer, this layer, it's more like clinical trial. It's like, because you know all this already, you can pick and choose. And you pick this, to apply to this and you realize it backfired. It didn't work. Now you write it down and you learn something. So this part isn't just about reading. This part is about doing. It's about applying and it's about learning from your mistakes. That's why when Buddha taught us all the things that he knew, he taught us according to how he, through his trials and errors, through all the lives, all the different lives and all the different um, reincarnations he understood and that's how he shared with us how to change how to learn and how to apply that's what he shared with us okay so that's why Bodhisattva it takes a long time because all the knowledge there is has to apply to all the different problems that's faced by all the sentient beings that's why it takes a very long time that's what this is now the third part it's called the Buddha knowledge when you repeat the first layer, which is understand all and learning everything, and repeat to apply to all the different types of sentient beings, to all the different types of problems, to, uh, to all the different types of background, all the different surroundings, all the different capacities. When you learn everything and apply everything correctly, then you reach the third level. So it's almost like studying is the first part. Practicing is the second part when you have studied everything and when you have practiced all there is practice, then you reach Buddhahood. Then you have all the Buddha knowledge. So, so that's why it's, it's, it's very structured and it's very layered. And in, the, in chapter 22, you keep on seeing this all the time. You keep on seeing this thing coming back to these three knowledge, uh, wisdoms all the time. It's, it's veiled. You're not going to see it. Master doesn't tell you it's these three. But it's veil, it's, it's showing you that, you know, yeah, it, you're knowing this. And then you realize it's not quite right. You have to do it, give it the right touch, give it the right fix so that they could actually accept it. Exactly. Okay, so, so if three actions, if three actions describe the attitude of the teacher, then three wisdoms describe the necessary knowledge to be able to teach Dharma, right? You have to know there is, you have to know the right capacity and you have walked it, you have done it before, then you will be able to teach other people. Okay, so lastly, we want to get into the three roles, which is student, teacher, and both. Both the student and both the teacher. Okay, so, so I think this chapter is, is, is wonderful because Master is expanding our horizon to see much more than just follow the sutra. It's telling us from the perspectives you know, a, an attitude of a teacher of Dharma. And it tells you that what a teacher should have. But it also tells you as an attitude of a student, as an attitude of a teacher, and as an attitude of both a student and teacher. How does that work? So Master told us that as a student, you have to be very courteous. Master shared with us a particular story that I think if you're at the abode, you don't have to be at the abode. I think it's very common for all the world. You know, as a student, as someone who is learning, right, as someone who is learning, 
um, you would have people coming to teach you, a guidance, a, a guide, or a mentor that comes to teach you. One of the things that everybody complains is that when you have three mentors coming to tell you and tell you different things, and a master was skillful to share with us that you should be grateful that there are three mentors coming to tell you, telling you three different things. That used to be the one thing that I hated the most, right? You would be doing one thing and three people come along and they all tell you different things on how to do something. And you go like, you know what? Why don't you have a little meeting and you come up with one thing so that I know how to follow. But master say, no, you have to be very grateful because three people are willing to tell you their experiences and why you, shouldn't do, you should do certain things a certain way. You have to be always courteous, always be grateful, and be diligent to learn all of them. Why? Because one day, one day, you are going to be able to determine for yourself which of the three you should use. That's your wisdom. That's part of the second tier of knowledge. Remember, first tier is to know and to learn all. As a student, that's your job, is to learn and know all. Be diligent and be grateful. If there are five people come to tell you, that just means that you have good affinity with these people. So then that's why they come over and they think they want to share with you. What would it be if no one comes by, if everybody comes by and see you're stuck and no one gives their opinion, then you will still be stuck. You should be grateful that there are five people telling you. You just need to have the wisdom to know how to apply them and when to use which. That's the second part of the knowledge. So as a student, always be courteous, be diligent, and be grateful. Now, as a teacher, you have to be kind and gentle, right? Because a student doesn't always get it right away. But you have to be kind and gentle. You have to accompany with them along the journey. Now, that's all very hard because who has the time, right? So that's why Buddha says it takes a long time to achieve Buddhahood because that's what he did. He was kind and gentle and he has the, the perseverance and the kindness to accompany you along with the journey. And there's no giving up. Don't give up. You know, if this way doesn't work, try something else. And that's what the Buddha did, right? So as both the teacher and the student, right? And this is the part that, that I found to be the most important. I think there was evident in the last few days, in the morning Dhamma talk, Master talks about there's nothing special. Don't think of yourself as special when you're the student of dharma or the teacher of dharma it's actually part of our ordinary lives it's actually part of something that we're supposed to do anyway okay so don't think of us as now i'm preaching dharma now i'm very special no it's part of something that is very ordinary dharma is all around us don't make it special by thinking that it has to be a very special setting but like you have to be meditating to get it. No, it's all around us. So it's just like learning. It's like learning how to eat, learning how to breathe. It's not something so special, but it's something very crucial. And it's all in the ordinary. And when you have such ordinarity, that is the most extraordinary. That is the most important, is that because everything is so ordinary, then everything combined together. It is so extraordinary. Remember, that's what we said last week too. What is rare? Rare is something that is not seen often. But when you're able to practice in such, a often, in such an often and always, then it is not so rare anymore. And it becomes something of a norm. You have changed something that seemed to be impossible and rare into something that is very frequent and norm. This is the same way, you know, always think of it as ordinary. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. I am just connecting with the earth. I am just doing my job as a member of the community. I am not doing more, nor am I doing less. I am just doing what I'm supposed to do. When you've done that, when you're doing that as a teacher of Dharma, as a student of Dharma, I'm just learning everything I can I'm just trying to know everything I can and be courteous. When you're just sticking to the ordinary path, then that is the most extraordinary. So these are the three things, the three action, three wisdom, and three roles that 
that I got from the first week of this chapter 22. And um, it's very different in chapter 22 because it tells you how you teach. It tells you how you learn. And it tells you when you encounter people that don't believe you, how do you change your course but don't give up? And it comes in with all these three wisdoms and the three rules. Now, I really want to get into the questions and I want to do a quick fire way to uh, quickly get through all of them because some of them requires a lot of explanation. Some of them requires explanations that don't make sense. So I'm not going to go through them, but let's start with the first, the toughest one. Okay. So since our original nature is Buddha nature, how does our ignorance come about? Great question. And this question has been asked and tried to answer by sages and all the very, you know, um, wise monks and nuns in the past. Uh, grandmasters have tried to answer this question. Now, whether it actually satisfies you or not, it's a different issue. But let me try to answer this, right? So Buddha nature, original nature, our Buddha nature is a capacity, okay? It's a capacity, okay? So for example, our body has immune system. Since our body has immune system, how does it get sick? Good question. Same thing. Because of certain things, right? We're supposed to be immune to a lot of things. Our body defense system is supposed to help us. But why do we still get sick? Well, maybe it's not something that we're not prepared for. Maybe we just didn't have a good, good rest and therefore our immune system is low. Maybe we didn't have enough water to drink. Maybe we didn't have enough vitamin C. All these things combined together. Everybody has all these different things coming together. That's when it happened. Then our capacity is able to just like immune system, able to fight off the disease. But when something around us or something, a thought, a something that comes out that disrupts this nature, this immune system, all of a sudden we get sick. So same thing, original Buddha nature is supposed to be pure and clean, but something comes out, something around that comes out that disturbs this and causing more and more ignorance to pile onto it, okay? Now, if you want to ask me, well, what is the first thing that comes out? I can't answer that because I'm not there yet. I am thousands and millions of layers deep. I can see beyond all these layers to see why did the first one come out. But I'm trying to see what is the millionth one come out, and I'm, kind of, I'm trying to get rid of that. So what we can do, Master taught us to understand the causes. Yes, but I don't understand the cause of the first one because I'm not there yet. I am trying to get through the afflictions that I have right now and taking them apart one at a time, peel them off one at a time. And that is why this question is actually difficult to understand, but it's also very simple to understand. It's just because something you're surrounding, something happened. Just like how did the Big Bang happen? Well, we don't know. We're not there to know that. But we know why did you get mad at me? Why did you get mad at me? Well, because I did something bad to you. So that's something that we know, and we can focus on that and focus on that to peel the afflictions one at a time, okay? So I hope whoever asks this question, great question, and I hope you're satisfied because there won't be any answer, but there will be plenty of contemplations, okay? Next question. Okay, from reading from chapter one, it seems a lot is done on meditation. It has been in India for centuries. The power of meditation and how it will allow people to explore things that present human cannot, like seeing the human and non-human. It also lets you do other things, okay? The practice of meditation is not compulsory. So, so what this question, I think, is trying to say is that meditation, um, there's a lot of talk about meditation. Now, let me go through this, okay? First, meditation is, to meditate is a verb, okay? It's a verb. It's an action that you do. However, the actual Lotus Sutra that tells you or the Sutra that tells you, teaches you, it's about the state. It's called Samadhi. It's called peace, serenity. That's a state. So meditate is a verb. Samadhi is a state. The verb takes you from your current state to the state of Samadhi. That's what the verb is trying to do. Now, is that the only verb that will take you to Samadhi? No, but it's one of the verb, one of the action that will allow you to take you to Samadhi. Now, is that always going to work? 
No. Meditation, meditating, doesn't always take you to samadhi. It might take other things to work in unison to get there. Last night, we had a very good talk. For example, um, you, you can think of it this way. There's a glass of water and there's mud in there. That's why it's very muddy. The water is muddy. So from this side of the glass of water, you can see through the water to the other side. It's muddy, right? So same thing. Meditation is like, I am not moving the glass of water. I am sitting the glass of water on the table, not moving the glass of water, hoping that the water, the mud in the water will settle. When the, when the mud settles, you see through the water, you can see through it. Okay, so that's what meditation does. It helps you set the glass so it doesn't move. Now the problem comes. Well, I'm not moving the glass, but the table is moving. Meditation helps you not moving the glass. But what if the table is moving? What if the table isn't moving, but the room is moving? What if the room isn't moving, but the world is moving? What if nothing is moving, but I am moving? You are still not able to see clearly through the glass. So meditation is only one component of setting the mud down. But if somebody else is stirring it, it doesn't matter if the glass is not moving. The mud is still going to be in the water and obstructing your view. So is it compulsory? It's one of the ways to get a clear, water, clear glass of water. But it's not the only way. And it's one of the many things that had to come together. If the glass is sitting right there and you have a rod that keeps on stirring it, it's not going to be clear. Same thing. You are sitting there doing your own thing, meditating but your mind keeps on thinking about other things, then it won't matter that the glass is sitting there because your rod is keep on stirring it, okay? So it's not compulsory. It's one of the ways to get there. In Ziji, we talk about a different way to get there, which is through helping, selfless giving, okay? So I'm, I'm talking about quick fire and it's not so quick. Okay, so there is more mention of Sariputra in the Sutra than any other venerable like Ananda. Why is it because it's the one who pleaded the Buddha to expound? I don't think it is, but I think the 10 disciples, um, they're really 10 disciples, but they 10 disciples represent us, represent us. Sariputra represents the logical part of us, okay? So he is the foremost in wisdom or intellect. He represents that part of us, which is logic and sense and, and all the intellect, right? And that's what this is. Buddha always picks on him because this is not, a lesson of intellect. This is not a lesson of, of, of your logic. It's more than just logic, right? We talk about three layers of wisdom. The first part is all about logic and understanding the knowledge. But the second part is knowing when to apply which. That is not logic. So, so that's why I think Buddha using this to attack or to confront our sense of logic and says, you know, sometimes it's not just all logic. A lot of it is about emotions too. So don't just always focus on the logic. That's why Sariputra gets picked on a lot of times. That's my take on this. Each of these disciples represent a part of us. And the part that gets picked on the most is the one that we usually use to listen to the sutra. That's why it gets picked on. And it gets to say, you know what? Don't think of it this way. Think of it another way. That's why Sariputra gets picked on all the time. Okay, last question I'm going to go through. Okay, at this moment, with the pandemic, Master connect to so many people around the world with a touch of button. With the technology, many conversations, ideas, messages can be made known instantly to the mind of people online with Master. Great. How is it that Dharma can be transmitted more easily, yet difficult to understand? Very simple. Okay, so we talk about all the sand in the Ganges River, right? You can have all the sand in the Ganges River, in the shores of the Ganges River. It doesn't help you understand the sand itself. This sand is the same as the sand that's in your fingernail. You could take this sand and you can put it under the microscope. But if you have no time to put it under the microscope, giving you the entire shore of the Ganges River, all the sand in the world, you still don't know what this sand is made of. So having more vehicles connections, listening to more. If you don't have the time 
to sit down and put it under the microscope. You could have all the sand in the world and you still don't know what the sand is made out of because you don't have time to contemplate and to really listen. But if you do have the time to contemplate and you do have the mindfulness to really understand, then all you need is one. And that's what this is about. Okay, so, so from one to infinity, you can have all the sand in the world. It doesn't make you understand this sand even better. But if you have time to go in deeper, then just having one particle of sand will allow you to understand more. Okay, I'm getting through these questions and I hope that it will help you, some of you, to contemplate a little bit more. But like I said, no exact answers, just contemplation and reflections. And I hope that help you, that help all of us to move on. So thank you, that's my sharing for today. We'll move on to the, sh the sharing from the centers. Thank you. Most gratitude, Brother Joe. <laughs> Truly wonderful session yesterday and continue today. Okay, today we have uh, Brother Wong Sing Choi from Nibong Tabao, North Penang, to share with us uh, his uh, insights uh, during this COVID-19 uh, lessons from making the facial mask if there's time. Brother will also share with us his journey in vegetarianism. So over to you, Brother Wong. Kaan. Beloved Master Cheng, Sang Ren, about Masters, Brother Joe, brothers and sister, a very good morning. Today, I would like to share two things during this uh, pandemic, COVID-19. Now, the first one is lesson from face shield making. And the second thing I would like to talk about would be vegetarianism. So let's see the 18th of March in Malaysia, MCO, Movement Control Order, was implemented. So for one week, I didn't do anything because all of us stay at home. So come on the 20th, <clears throat> On the 25th, we had a PIC meeting. Then I saw something. I discovered something. Oh, there are some people doing face shield, distributing face masks, and so on. And the next day, on the 26th, we had our Zoom meeting with our brothers and sisters in Nibong Taba. And we came to a conclusion, we will make face shields for the front liners. And immediately the next day, we went and purchased the necessary materials. Now we let's look at the master's uh, morning discourse on the 20th of April, the pandemic that envelops the entire world is the shed karma of all sentient beings. How can we overcome the endless sufferings in fitting mankind now? The one and only magical cure, a miraculous formula, is pious, repentance, abstention from killing, and adoption of vegetarianism, as well as the active expression of the spirit of great love. So first, we make face shields so that we can contribute to the frontliners. So, so the four in one, uh, 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 who share Zoom meeting on the 25th and on the 26th, we purchase the required materials. And materials are as follows. A4 plastic sponge, broad size rubber band, Yuhu glue, steel ruler, scissors, printed, stickers, sanitizers, and gloves, and also face masks. And we cut the sponge and rubber band according to the Penang General Hospital specifications. So we divide the facial makings into three phases. The phase, first phase, they take home Brothers and sisters will take home the necessary materials and 
to apply sufficient glue to fix the sponge and staple the rubber band appropriately. That's the first phase. And the second phase, we have QC. We have to, we have to quality control. We have to check all the, uh, what you call the pro produce, the product that they have made. Then we have to fix the Suchi sticker. Sterilize, then pack them before they are sent to the destinations. So the face shield distribution to the frontliners will be the final phase. Uh, this is the face one, that the face shields. The face shields here, all the materials are cut into the various required specifications. The second phase, they, they check and then they stick the sticker accordingly. Sterilize, then then packing. These are the boxes. So after for two days, they did all this and then we have the ready products. And once you have the ready products, Back into the boxes, then what to do and where to, what to do with the finished product and where to. So our target, got, uh, the, our target groups comprise of the frontliners, the doctors, nurses, and the, the other staff, police at the checkpoints, and those who work for the unfortunate. Here I call them the unfortunate means the jail. Okay. So our destinations are as follows, hospitals, health clinics, dental clinics, dialysis centers, police headquarters, and center for the unfortunates. So we also make it to the, to the jail. So this is the Sungai Bakap Hospital. So we send the face finish, uh, face shield to the Sungai Bakap. This is Dr. Nobila, and she was very, 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 very pleased with our, our contribution. And this is the Bukit Panchor, Bukit Panchor uh, Health Clinic. This is the police HQ, police HQ. And here you don't see people, this is the penjara seberang prai. Penjara here means jail in Malaysia. So we send the face shields from, this is Mibong Tebal. Can you see Mibong Tebal? So it's the second bridge here. To Penang is around 45 minutes drive. Yeah? This is Nibong Tebal, and to the north, we have the Simpang Empat. So we send to the health clinic, and in Malaysia, it's very unique. The health clinic and the dental clinic are built together in the same building. So we send to both, we contribute to both organi uh, uh, organizations. So they are two different organizations. So then we come to uh, the dialysis center in Simpang Pat. We also uh, go to the hospital Sungai Bakap, the dialysis center Sungai Bakap, the police station in the south. Actually, Nibong Tabao is in the south province, province Wellesley. And the complex penjara, this is the, the jail and clinic kesihatan pergigen nibong tebal together in the same building, but different sections. And we even went to hospital Paribunta. <clears throat> hospital Paribunta. And eventually we even went to Perak. This is Perak already. Parabunta is Perak. And uh, 
as far as Bakan Sarai. As far as Bakan Sarai. So this is our journey, is our destination that covered. So from Penang, Simpampat, to Paribunta, Pera. Okay? That is the end as far as Bakan Sarai. So the first, the first phase volunteer participation are as follows and they complete this to be completed at home. Okay, they took back and complete at home. So the number of brothers and sisters who participated are 48 and three other. Phase two at is being carried out at Nibung Tobao Center. And the uh, number of volunteers participated are 20, but each section consists of not more than eight participants. There are not more than eight participants in the, uh, in the center, in the center. So the final space is patched, consists of only three volunteers. Each distribution consists of not more than two persons. So the time uh, covered is morning and afternoon session and ended at 5 p.m. for phase two. And it covers from 30th of March to 15th of April. And for the final phase, the office hour, only for office hour, we could do the distribution. <laughs> Our greatest mistake was we did not apply for the police permit because we do not know whether where to apply. Actually, we do not know. Actually, in the first uh, first day, we do not know what to do, where to send the face shields. So finally, we sit down. We sat down and thought about it, the destinations, and then we. We call them before we send out. So we, that's why we could do the, uh, what they call, uh, we can go to the destination safely and smoothly. So that's uh, our greatest mistake that it's not proper that we did not uh, prepare, uh, apply for the police permit. So that is very important. Huh? Due to our minds deluded by five poisons, possibly, we couldn't, uh, we had caused tremendous damage to our world. We need to be humble and respectful of Mother Nature. So why did we say to the front liners? So when we send this face shield, we, fir we first thank all the front liners with utmost gratitude for serving the Rakyat here in Malaysia, Rakyat means citizens, without fear or favor, wish them good health and ever safe in carrying out their duties. So the frontliners respond, they were very touched indeed and grateful to the volunteer for their contribution without asking for any forms of return. The third time we visited Dr. Nabila at the Sungai Bakak Hospital, she told us that she had learned about the silent, silent mentor at the medical faculty in Malaya, uh, University of Malaya. We also invited her to join TIMA, that is the uh, Tsuchi International Medical Association, and she tried to in the near future. So our greatest finding is the complex Penjara Sungai Jawi, that is the uh, the jail, the, the, the director wished to invite Suchi to carry out a program to help the unfortunates. Here, the unfortunates, because they have followed the wrong path. That's why they arrived at the wrong des destination. So we hope we could do something in the near future after the MCO, the lockdown is lifted. So we should cherish our bodies since they can help us to do good deeds. We must make good use of our bodies for all our achievements are accumulated gradually through 
bodily action. That is Master Cheng Yan of Sangden's Jing Shu aphorism. Another aphorism, you must be determined to reach the goal of becoming a Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva is, will do what he has to do, no matter how difficult it is, and he will do so as happily as if he were playing a game. Next, I will talk about the vegetarianism, my own story. So before I became a vegetarian, that was before uh, year 2009, I was just like most of us. Okay? That, uh, we, I, that time I took a lot of uh, vegetables also, but still take to me. But as people ask me to become a vegetarian, then I was like, no, I would say, no, it's vegetables also like, no, it has life also. And therefore, uh, it's very difficult. Okay? It's a very difficult task to promote vegetarianism. I myself also had the same behavior. So then come 2009. I participated in the performance of musical, musical sign language drama, Sutra of the Innumerable Meanings, Wu Liang Yijing, in Pisa Penang. We had uh, an audience of 10,000, and it's very, very touch. So in order to that is my turning point. In order to participate, all participants have to uh, be vegetarian for 108 days. 108 days. So that is what exactly my turning point. I participated by singing. By singing, the, because it's drama, you have uh, the musical, you have sign language, you have drama. So I took part in the, uh, the singing session and, and uh, after, the, after the, the performance on 26 December 2009, my Su asked me, what is next? So my turning point, my becoming uh, the vegetarian is so smooth. I just told her, just continue, let's continue. Then we continue until today. It's very uh, fortunate that and very thankful to my, uh, my Suche. We together, we became vegetarian until today. So the master's call, every day we can hear from our master or the morning discourse, the Jing Se, Masters also say the same thing. It's a must now. Fei Su Buka is a must. Why is a must? Because this morning, as I heard from the Master Cheng Yan, our beloved, beloved Sang Ren, mentioned it again, is to mitigate COVID-19. And uh, the second wave may come and it's become even worse. So we hope that we can, all of us can promote vegetarianism and all online brothers and sisters, I hope all of us can do our part. That's the end of my sharing for today. Thank you very much, Kandan. Uh, all right, Kan and brother Sim Choi for a simple um, strength. Oh, okay. Yeah. So actually, um, very grateful uh, that brother Joe and uh, brother Wong sharing today. Brother Joe sharing on the uh, turning on the transcendent power, and then how how we turn uh, something impossible into a new norm yeah uh, and this 
on, on this part, I can see uh, Brother Wong sharing. Uh, uh, there is some example that we can uh, see how we how we change the how we turn the impossible into new norm. For example, just now I saw uh, in Brother Wong sharing that uh, there is a lot of planning and and logistics involved in uh, making the shield. Uh, if for ordinary people, maybe we'll see that. Oh, um, okay. So, so making facial and then delivering it to, uh, to the, to the centers that need all these things, actually look quite uh, quite complicated, and uh, people will feel that it, it's quite a daunting task. But, uh, but to us, we'll think that hey, actually this is quite normal because we have been. Even before the pandemic, we have been. Uh, it is very normal for us to do a lot of this kind of planning and uh, and help the people. Yeah, so we have accumulated all these uh, all these experiences, and then uh, we are merely uh, using our experience to to overcome all the obstacles in uh, during this pandemic to do all the necessary things. Even uh, not only not only giving the PPE, but also uh, trying to find ways to uh, to connect with our Dharma uh, Dharma families and also uh, to share about vegetarianism to promote vegetarianism, yeah. Uh, and and then uh, today we also hear Brother George talk about the three knowledge, uh, the uh, yeah the three knowledge. So uh, just now and also the three the three actions. Uh, uh, for example, without fear, right? Then uh, Brother Wong also share about uh, the Bodhisattva uh, do things, I mean, without fear, but uh, take it as uh, like playing a game. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, a very important spirit that we should, uh, we should have. And uh, the three knowledges, uh, first layer, the first layer is like, uh, we, we know all the things and then, uh, we can apply it on ourselves. So, uh, and then the second layer is uh, we do by trial and error. And then the third level is uh, how how uh, is to know how to apply all this knowledge uh, to different people. So, uh, I think vegetarianism is also like this way. So, in the first level, we will 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 try to learn all the uh, all the knowledge on nutrients uh, on the diets. <laughs> but then uh, we have to. Uh, but the next level is we should share with other people. But different people have different uh, have different needs, or they have different circumstances. So uh, and maybe they, maybe not all people can accept uh, one kind of uh, one kind of explanation. Or yeah, some some people. They, uh, we have to share from the perspective of uh, nutrition. Some we have to share from the perspective of compassion. So there are different ways of promoting vegetarianism. And, uh, but we have to, we don't know uh, what kind of people need what kind of explanation. We have to uh, do it by trial and error. And then uh, when we have done all this, we can move on to the third level. Yeah. So uh, become a master of uh, Promoting vegetarianism, like uh, like Shang <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is what I can see from the. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Uh, Brother Wong sharing actually echoes uh, what has been shared by Brother Joe today. Yeah. Uh, simple sharing from me, and maybe let's see Brother Joe. Do you want to? <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, over to Sister Xiaoqing. Um, um, brother Joe, Brother Jing Guan, and uh, Brother Wong. Today we have three great brothers uh, uh, sharing uh, great dhammas with us. Ka'an for lots of heart thought and wisdom sharing. Okay. Okay, today, okay, maybe we, we still do a closure now uh, because Master. Uh, morning, brothers, sisters, Omni Tofu. Uh, welcome to our this, uh, extended session. Uh, very grateful to Brother Joe Wong and Sister Xiu Ching for. Initiating this uh, new extended extension of Siu Fa Xiang online sharing with Hua Lian. Uh, this session will run for 30 minutes from 8 to 8.30 uh, every Saturday. 
Uh, today we are very grateful to have our brother Zhu Wei with us to share his insight. Uh, even though brother Zhu Wei is uh, new to Ciji, uh, when he received the invitation to share uh, without any hesitation, he grabs this opportunity. Uh, brother Zhu Wei, uh, since you are new to us, maybe I request you to also give us a brief introduction about yourself. So we welcome brother Zhu Wei. Uh, now, brother Zhu Wei. Uh, thank you, Sister Siu Ching, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share what I learned in the last few days of uh, Xin Fa Xiang. Uh, the last few days of Xin Fa Xiang is on chapter 22 and trust men. So I learned that uh, one of the preparation for uh, walking the Bodhisattva path is to purify my mind. Uh, and then uh, the other point is uh, what uh, Brother Joe has uh, taught me, uh, start from one. And the other important point that I get is to practice forbearance. Uh, and then also we need to bring others onto the path. Uh, on pur purify my mind, uh, on the 7th of June, Master says that our life may be futile if we are not mindful. And Master says every day at the start and towards the end of Xin Fa Xiang, Always be mindful. Allow me to share with you how these three words uh, touch my heart. When I visited Hualien last year, I had the opportunity to wash oranges uh, for the lunch preparation. I was thinking, why do we need to wash the orange? Since we just cut it and eat what is inside. As I was washing, I came to realize that there are so much lessons in this exercise. Shi Fu told me, you have to use more energy. If not, they will not be clean enough. And Shi Fu would also tell me, you are slowing down the next one in line, as you are too slow. So I learned all of these lessons as a, something that is a task like washing oranges can be something that uh, we need to be very mindful about. Uh, then we can learn these lessons and uh, something which uh, we were taking lightly. So this itself is my first lesson of always be mindful. During that time, I was going through a difficult period in my life. It was not so serious that I need to seek medical help, but I had been depressed for a few years due to a broken marriage. I was lost about the meaning of life. Last year, when I was at the Shanghai Jing Shi Book Cafe, Gan En to Sister Chi Yi, who is also here today, who brings me to Chi Ji. And before I take my very first Jing Shi aphorism, I asked myself, how do I have the strength and energy to walk out from depression and to do, contrib to do contribution to others? Because contribution to others would be the meaning of life. I ask this sincerely in my heart. And you know what? What I picked was this one. Start with good intentions and one will head in the right directions. Make good vows and one will have the strength to contribute. Imagine at the moment I felt so touched and I, I had tears in my eyes. As I start to join Chi activities, I found that all the details are prepared with so much mindfulness. For example, the chairs are so neatly arranged, everywhere is so clean, everyone is so mindful of everything. I started to understand the principle of always be mindful are everywhere in Chi And these words start to lead me onto a journey to search deeply into my inner self. What are the causes? and start to address them, to make changes. For example, I start to think before words are uttered from my mouth. And I've become 100% vegetarian since sometime July, August last year. I started to realize that always be mindful, give me the awareness to change my thought. And changing a thought is powerful. It can change relationship, it can change life, as it raises my consciousness of others in interpersonal relationship. It is a process and a long way to go, but it really has helped me. And I can feel it almost like a form of spiritual power we learn under chapter 21. 
And as Master teaches us on chapter 22 today, always be mindful these three words resonate with me like Buddha touching the forehead of Bodhisattva three times. And uh, from the Shin Fa Xiang, the last few days, uh, two of the sh sharings from masters in terms of uh, the Myanmar rice bank, which was which master taught us on the 7th of June itself, and the Shirin mother running with the baby from Syria to Jordan. Uh, these two, the first one, I understand the Myanmar rice bank. The message to me is like, start from one. Also, what Brother Joe has taught, taught us uh, in a lot of his sharing. What happened in Myanmar some years ago, this man with polyomyelitis, he's poor, his body is weak, but he wants to do his part to help others. He struggled to crawl over and with so much effort, managed to grasp a handful of rice to put into the rice bank bottle for his contribution. And the Chi volunteer told him, your handful of rice is as big as Mao Sumeru. These few words by the sister were so wise and so powerful that it empowered him and raised his confidence. Over the years, the Qing Si aphorism printed on the rice bag transformed the village into one with Dharma joy and spiritual wealth where the villagers help the poor to help one another. So to me, this is the power of starting from one. And what I learned from the Shirin mother running with baby from Syria to Jordan is that what separates life and death is that line, is the border. It is the same line which separates darkness and light the same line which separates greed and generosity, which separates anger and forbearance, the same line which separates ignorance, afflictions, and wisdom. So the border between Syria and Jordan, on one side is full of sufferings, full of afflictions, bullets, death, and on the other side is full of hope as we see the surviving baby growing up with the globally -like recognized education. Uh, the message to me is that I have to diligently practice the six parameters. Diligently walking the Bodhisattva path, understanding the law of karma, fulfilling responsibilities, and all of this helped me to be calmer and to be more focused amidst the COVID-19 situation and the anxieties and distrust we are facing. And the other part which I'm very touched is the uh, about the forbearance. Uh, on the eighth, Xin Fa Xiang, Master says, Ren wu ke, for ren, wu si ren wu ke ren. So for, forgiving itself, if we really understand the meaning, it's not something we have to endure because it's actually nothing. It's not there. There's nothing to endure. Not it is too much that I cannot endure. These words resonate a lot with my heart. Master says at the moment, you feel your belly treated and you hear any harsh words, immediately wear the robe of gentleness and forbearance. So I start to practice this in daily life since I learned about never slighting bodhisattva and this robe of gentleness and forbearance. I remind myself that every person has the inherent Buddha nature. So I use this method, I think of the person, I think of the harsh words, the supposedly painful situation, as a sparring partner offering me the opportunity to practice, practice and practice. So to home, I can only feel garden. I often remind myself, master advice, that we must walk into the darkness to light up the place, like what happened at Tawa, Malaysia. So amazingly, Thinking like that takes away the pain and brings me joy and peace. Exactly as our master said, The room of gentleness and forbearance is very comfortable, very soft, It can take away much of our burden and sufferings. And in the process, I feel that I think I become a better person. And about bringing others onto the path, I learned that not only 
do I need to walk the Bodhisattva path? I also need to bring others onto the path. I need to learn well the ways in order to do so. So on the 9th of June, Xin Fa Xiang Master teaches about being observant like a doctor. Like a surgeon, we need to be very mindful and understand deeply other people's needs so that we can really touch their hearts with Dharma. We don't want to give people what they do not need. So before giving, actually, this kind of works well. We need to be very mindful about so that we really help the person. In addition, we also need to be fearless to speak out and to share the Dharma that we learn with others. This means that I need to be diligent and stay fast to learn the Dharma. If I remember in my heart and have practiced it myself, then there's no fear in sharing with others. And on the 11th of June, Shin Fasiang, Master reminded us to be soft in manners and to be respectful. Whether we are receiving guidance and learning, or we are actually helping and guiding another, we need to just emulate our masters to learn from her because her tone, the way that she is teaching us daily, this really touches my heart. I also need to be mindful to use skillful means when I encounter someone who is not able to accept or believe the teaching, but do not give up on anyone. I learned to understand that bringing onto others onto the path and walking well without deviation myself, actually, these two are mutually reinforcing. Can uh, to Sister Siu Ching for giving me this opportunity to share, and can to Sister Elsie and to Sister Chi for always being there for me, and can to all the brothers and sisters for listening. Can uh, truly wonderful, uh, sincere, and deep, insightful sharing uh, from Brother Tsui. Kanan so much. Uh. Uh, Brother Joe, please. Um, I, I'm very touched and um, very inspired uh, because Brother Tsui was able to um, so um, simply to use a few words and, and, and use the very succinct and concise language to be able to explain uh, some of the key points. And I think this is just um, the wonderful part is that when you're having this gong show, then you have everybody think, picking their three or four points. And isn't this just like three or four or 10, or right now we have 75 members on this Zoom right now, you know, 75 people or 10 people like our mentors, right? And we're just talking about conflicting mentors. You know, there isn't conflict when we're able to take in all, you know, if, if, if the role of a student is able to expand the heart so wide that regardless of what the mentor was telling you, there would be big enough space to fit all their teachings then there wouldn't be conflict at all. It would just be, you know, put into different places so that we can use them at different times to different people, at different surroundings and, and et cetera. So I think, thank you, Brother Zue, for um, very, very clearly uh, sharing this. Now, you mentioned, and uh, I'd like to uh, go, go to how you um, part them, how you part them. I think it's, it's just like what, uh, uh, Brother Jing Kwan had talked about, you know, um, first is, is really um, to do for yourself, right? Purify the mind and that you mentioned that to be, always be mindful. And I think that's a very powerful tool. And when you're mindful, you're able to begin to observe many things, begin to realize, see many things, know where you are, know what we're doing, know what we're thinking know what others are doing, know what others are doing and, and thinking. And, and when that happens, your mind is racing now. It, it's, it's, you're almost like a sponge absorbing every, everything. And I think that's the first, I don't know, some, some, I don't know, 16, 15 or 16 chapters. It's all telling us about how to understand, right? All these different chapters about the parables, about the stories, they're all there to inspire you to know more, inspire you to see more and don't give up, right? It's all about building your character so that you could learn. 
And then there are more beyond that, which is now you need to practice and you need to um, pass on to others, which is where we are right now. So I think it always goes from in to out. And so start from what, right? Start from one knowledge, start from one chair, start from one thing, start from yourself, and then you can go on to a lot more. And I think in the past few chapters, beginning with chapter 20, the, the never sliding, and there were others before that too, always share about the difficulties that you're going to encounter. And I think in this chapter, we also heard about Master really going into detail, and I was very grateful. You know, when I was um, uh, going through this and, and the different roles of the student and the teacher, I was very grateful because Master helped us set the mindset. So she didn't just tell us, you need to do this, this, and that, right? You, didn't, you need to be She didn't just tell us the slogans, but she tell us how, you know? Why should you feel grateful when you have three mentors coming to you with different ideas? Why? And, and how should you be very kind and gentle when you're teaching to, you know, your students? All these things, ideas, we understand but it's so hard to apply them without something tangible. And, and I think that was something that gave us a lot of inspiration. And to, to know and to see that, that this message was spread out to everybody, including um, Brother Zhiwei, I, I think this is, it's wonderful. And to see all of us, whether we're in here for a long time, or we just began, or whatever reason why we're here, you know, to see all this and put it into practice, I think is very, very inspirational. So thank you. And, and I know that uh, for every day you're doing a lot of these sharing that really gets you the depth, the depth in the Dharma so that you're able to observe more, feel more, and have more trial and error so that it lets you observe even more. And I think as you accumulate on the first layer, second layer, then you're going to reach the final, uh, the third part, the, the third wisdom, the Buddha wisdom even faster, in or even sooner. And that's what Master was trying to tell us. So uh, lastly, before, uh, before I end, um, I also think that in this chapter, entrustment, um, I think last week we talked about in thrust. Um, now you're put to the forefront. Um, but I think it's a different, you know, this week, this, this past week, I have a different understanding and feeling, you know, in, including today and yesterday's morning Dharma talk. Um, I think it's not so much you're being thrusted. I think it's the vows of the disciples. Um, I don't want to see this as a reminder because it's an ending. I don't want to see this as because the Buddha was going away, was, um, was, was entering Nirvana. That's why he had to remind all of us. I think this is more of a, the disciples are ready. We are ready and we are willing. And because we are willing and because we are ready, Master is giving us the reminders. It's almost like, you know, um, when you're about to leave for, you know, an international relief, Master will give you the words of reminder. It's not because she isn't going to be here anymore. It's because we are ready to embark on this journey. So I see entrustment as something not passively accepted by the disciples. I see this in, as a very active um, shouldering of the responsibility. And therefore, our teachers are entrusting this knowledge and basically telling us, you have it all already. I'm just going to give you the blessing as I do to everybody because you're going to do fine. But it is not because the teacher is leaving us. It is because we are ready. And, and that's how I like to believe the, our relationship with Master. That's why all the Bodhisattvas, they're all saying, Teacher and Buddha, Buddha, Lord Buddha, we'll do this. Do not worry. And it's, I think it's very active. It's not passive at all. It's not because I am going away. Now I need to pass on to you. No, I think it's, we, after all these chapters, we are ready and we're doing this. And that's why the teacher is giving us the reminders before we go off to our endeavor and shouldering the responsibility. Okay, thank you. That's my, that's my share. Thank you, brother. Robert? Thank you. Yes, Kanan. Uh, indeed, I just want to add, uh, I could agree with brother Joe more. I, I feel another word may, be, may I allow to add is, I think, Masang is empowering us. 
empowering us with this uh, responsibility uh, to give us the confidence uh, to move, uh, move forward. Okay. Uh, before we end today's uh, session, uh, we wish to express our kindness and gratefulness to all who are here today uh, to listen and to share. And of course, kindness to our courageous and uh, heartfelt sharing from Brother Tzu Wei. And utmost kindness to our fearless and energetic uh, Brother Joe for sharing your giving us your great insights and guidance. <laughs> so let us continue to learn from each other and uh, cultivate together diligently. A uh, gentle reminder, uh, please uh, don't forget our appointment with uh, Master tomorrow morning at 5.20. So see you. Have a good day. Amitofo. Bye-bye.